<clears throat> okay, uh, hello. Uh, today is um, uh, May 11th, uh, 2023, and we'll talk about two architects, both related to uh, this day, May 11th. We'll start with the Frenchman, with Henri Labrust, a very important French architect. And uh, here he is, here he was, here he is, because important architects like important artists or writers or engineers or anything don't really die. I mean, they die like everybody else, but somehow they continue to live through their works, mainly. Henri Labrust. Henri Labrust, born May 11th and died in 1875. French architect important for his early use of iron frame construction. And indeed, iron frame construction was very important for him, and we'll see why. Born in Paris, died in Fontainebleau. Uh, Labrust entered the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1819, won the Prix de Rome for architecture in 1824, and spent the period from 1825 to 1830 in Italy, after which he opened a studio in Paris. Labrust is primarily remembered for the two Parisian libraries he designed, the Bibliothèque saint Genevieve, built between 1843 and 1850, is still admired for the attractiveness and restraint of its decoration, and for the sensitive use of exposed iron structural elements, columns and arches. Labrust is also remembered for his second library project, the Reading Room from 1860-1867 of the Bibliothèque Nationale, also in Paris. Its roof consists of nine decorated metal domes supported by slender cast iron columns. So, Oni Labrust, architect français. Uh, few images of his works, and you see here at the bottom the, the library that um, I read about, and the, the right uh, upper corner, um, the one built, uh, the reading room at the Bibliothèque Nationale that was built about 10 years later. Here he is as a statue. If, if uh, you work hard and you have something to offer to human society, you become a statue at one point. Not too many statues of women uh, based on the you know, accomplishments, cultural accomplishments, but maybe times will change. Not that this is the goal of life to become a statue, but uh, uh, maybe it's not so bad to become a statue. Labrust, Henri Labrust. Henri Labrust, structure brought to light. Um, a rather convenient uh, title for an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA. Drawing, some drawings of Henri, Henri Labrust. Uh, we, what do we see here? We see ornament. And yes, in the 19th century, architects didn't give up ornament. Uh, well, they, they actually cultivated it um, some uh, times frenetically. Uh, but he was, he was trained in, a, in the Beaux-Arts system, which, which was uh, uh, an educational system uh, that uh, would have been inconceivable in the absence of ornament. But he was a modern architect, and, and yet a sensitive modern architect who even within structure introduced ornamental elements. And I will suggest to you to try to do the same, because today, thanks to parametry and other techniques that we have, uh, it's possible to unite structure with ornament. As Patrick Schumacher said, they should come together. Uh, structure and ornament. The structure could become ornamental and the ornament could, could become structural. Uh, so we, we just look at some graphic works by Henri Labrust. 
Uh, here you see, you know, it's the cast iron uh, structure, but which does not reject ornament. Ornament is part of the structure. Today, we would not do something like this. You know, this, this kind of, uh, you know, um, flowery, um, you know, structural element. It, it would be almost inconceivable, although ornament in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the recent days came back with a, with a significant force. And I would suggest uh, we shouldn't ignore ornament these days. No. Uh, ornament existed in architecture since the beginning of architecture. You see, detail, uh, the tie, the decor, the large propose par la bruste. Uh, detail of the decoration of the arch proposed by um, uh, Henri Labrust or the bridge of Concorde or de la Concorde, maybe leading to Place de la Concorde. This drawing is kind of interesting. Uh, I admire a lot the two temples at Pestum. And I suggest to you, if you travel to Italy, not to ignore going south, you know, in, in the south of Italy, to see the Pestum temples, which are formidable. They are pre-Doric. They are so formidable that uh, Louis Kahn, for example, said that for him, the temples of Pestum are more, were more important than the Parthenon. And then Winkelmann, Winkelmann and Goethe admired them, and Piranesi, the great Piranesi, made a whole series of, of uh, etchings with the great temples of, of uh, especially the temple of Hera at Pestum, uh, built, uh, I don't know, 2,400 years ago, 2,500 years ago, about 400, 500 years before Christ. And here we see a drawing with a by La Brust, a study to, um, you know, uh, refurbish in a way the, the temple, but I'm not sure it would have been a great uh, thing to do. I mean, the temple as it is now is, is very impressive, even if it's incomplete and uh, with, uh, you know, ruined elements. Very, very impressive. So impressive that uh, I read that there is some kind of a, legend that uh, the couples which are not fertile, if they spend the night in the proximity of the temple, will become, would become, uh, will become fertile. Anyway, this about Pestu. So drawings by Onila Brust, uh, any student of the Bozar system drew a lot and they love to draw and uh, they drew manually, but uh, you know, using watercolors and so on. And uh, uh, there are remarkable drawings done by hand in the Bozar tradition. Here you see the Hera temple also. Uh, now, I don't know if in his, during his time, if it looked like this. Now, it doesn't have a roof. But if you check on the Google images, Pestum, Hera temple, you will see that indeed is a very, very moving uh, temple with an unbelievable power of the pre-Doric columns. Bibliothèque Saint-Genevieve, which he built, and we are going to see it. A very important work by him. Uh, apparently, he worked for a number of years for this library. Henri Labrust, Gravure extraite de l'Encyclopédie de l'Architecture. The 19th century was fascinated by history and uh, it had uh, an encyclopedic longing. 
not just the 18th, 19th century, but in, in the 19th century, yes, there was this uh, quest for uh, holy for wholeness in a way. Something that is lost uh, these days, I guess. Now we are going to see this most important work by him, Saint Genevieve Library, Place du Pantheon in Paris, 1838-1851. The Place du Pantheon is not far from Place de la Concorde. Uh, we saw that sketch, that drawing for the, the, the bridge of uh, de la Concorde. This is the library. Uh, Saint Genevieve, so again, Saint Genevieve Library. Uh, and from the outside, maybe it's not so impressive, but inside it is very much so. Maybe those are, I mean, you know, tourists, some visitors, some students staying in line, uh, not to buy a liter or so of milk like we, do, we did during communism, but to visit the great library by Henri Labrust. From the outside is, you know, like a box, an architectural box. But inside, uh, there are uh, subtleties that uh, make it uh, um, very distinct and, and, and very famous. And look at this. And especially look at the ceiling. You know, cast iron. It's structured, but it's flying. You know, it's, it's flying as if there are the wings of a butterfly. And again, it's because the ornament insinuated itself in the structure. But, you know, all in all, there is harmony here, but there is also uh, a grace. It's a graceful design. It could have been heavy, that, that roofing system, and it's not. It's light, and it's... Uh, inspiring you know you could even speculate uh, uh, metaphorically about you know the wings of knowledge you study uh, these massive tables and uh, through knowledge you fly not bad and the library is full of people as a good library should be an empty library is, is sad. Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve. It is as if nature found a way to enter architecture. You know, I mean, look at the, on the first floor, the ground floor, and also at the top, the, the sensitive treatment that, that, that made the even structure, which often is morose and static and rigid, sensitive. The plan is rectangular. It's a box, but because of the, uh, you know, sensitivity through which he um, uh, treated the uh, structure, uh, the box becomes uh, uh, devoid of uh, being oppressive, as often boxes are. Well, you see here on the arches also ornamental elements. Without them, the arch perhaps would have been a little bit more uh, stern, more rigid. Bibliothèque saint Genevieve, Paris, Henri Labrust. I try to extract, to remove the ornamental elements, you know, which are, you know, they are rather discreet. They are not... Uh, you know, provoking a violence in the building. But if you remove them, you know, even here, the profile of this piece of wood, you know, the certain elements in the, in the cast iron, and especially here, if you remove the ornament, you get a building that is less inspiring, 
Let's put it this way. So you, you ask yourself, or I ask myself, why did he need the ornament in the structure? He could have done without it. Not really, because as a student of the Bozar system, he, he quested for beauty. And structure by itself very, very rarely is beautiful, unless you know, the, the, the one who conceived the structure, conceived the structure, and there, are, there were such great, great engineers for whom structure became itself ornamental because of their concern with beauty. And the architect should not neglect this aspect, that, that structure by itself is not necessarily beautiful. In order to become beautiful, it needs special attention. It needs affection. In essence, it needs art. How to do it exactly is not easy, but it's possible and we see an example in this work. Bibliothèque saint Genevieve, Paris, mid 19th century, Henri Labrust. You see, it's almost embroidered, the structure. Le Grand Séminaire de Rennes, devenu la Faculté de Lettres puis de, de Sciences Économiques. Uh, it's another work from 1853 to 1872. Uh, again, towards the outside is not very impressive. You know, uh, a building. But here again, we see the, the horizontal structural elements in, in iron uh, having a, a more uh, you know, geometrical and discrete uh, ornamental uh, design, but it exists. Henri Labrust. Now the reading room at the National Library in Paris, which is magnificent, from 1854-1875. Here is a, an illustration, a um, rendering of the room. And uh, here is, you know, the Salle Labrust, uh, the reading room, which, uh, which is uh, well known and admired. A little bit confused. I don't know if probably Saloval is not by him. If if just one is called Sala Bruce, but we'll uh, we'll contemplate the. Uh, you know, here it is. Let me see something here. Yeah, this, this is Sala Bruce. Now, why did he why did he do the ceiling in this way? Why didn't he just make a flat? ceiling. I don't know exactly why, but I, I like to imagine that as a sensitive architect, he understood also the symbolic, the metaphorical uh, uh, meaning of the ceiling of a library. Because, because it's a, a library is about learning, is about studies, about, you know, uh, gaining knowledge. And what is the knowledge for? Through knowledge, you aspire towards, you know, a higher level of existence. Let's put it in a maybe, uh, you know, uh, excessively poetical way. I think a library like this with such a ceiling inspires instead of a flat, you know, flat uh, ceiling, which if it doesn't have also the, the necessary height, could be even oppressive. This room has a, a spirit and it, 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 it is uplifting you. You sit at the table and you, 
you look upwards and you get inspired. And it's important to be inspired. Because without inspiration, what is knowledge for? What is it so good for? As you can see, even, um, you know, uh, artistic events like, uh, you know, ballet and so on take place inside the um, reading room at the B B Bibliothèque Nationale. If gaining knowledge would be so graceful, like, uh, you know, like what we look at here today it would be great, but uh, we know very well that unfortunately gaining knowledge uh, could be quite uh, tedious or tedious, but, but it depends what we understand by knowledge. Just amassing a large number of data in your head, that's not knowledge. That's not knowledge. Knowledge is about understanding. And understanding has nothing to do with the memorization of who knows what, uh, uh, you know, uh, precise data, uh, you know, that's not knowledge. On the other hand, Einstein said that uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. Or maybe we can uh, negotiate a little bit and say knowledge is beautiful and fruitful, uh, useful, if it is coupled with imagination. And I guess that's exactly the meaning of this ceiling of uh, Bibliothèque Nationale, of this space, uh, Sala Brust, that La Brust designed. Because here we have knowledge and we have imagination. And the ceiling refers to the fantasies of an imagination that is uh, unbound. Never renounce imagination. Without imagination, knowledge becomes dry and even heavy. But this ceiling is not heavy. And it's not heavy exactly because it is imaginative. The room is very spacious indeed, but the ceiling is what makes it uh, truly special. It's important to address also the symbolic, metaphorical level of architecture, because in, 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 in their absence, you only get construction, you only get building. I kept uh, quoting from uh, that very important French poet, Paul Valéry, who in his little book, Eupalinos ou l'architect, Eupalinos or the architect, said that there are three kinds of builders. There is a builder who places a stone above a, another stone, and he is a builder. Then there is a second builder who places a stone above another stone and makes, makes them talk. He is a master builder. And then, then there is a third one who places a stone above another stone and makes them sing. Yes, sing. His name is Eupalinos or the architect. And this is what Labrust tried and achieved in this, in this particular work. The ceiling sings. Thus, Labrust was an architect, is an architect, and will be an architect. So that's where, you know, this reddish part, that's, that's where the Labrust uh, uh, room is, the reading room in the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in, in Paris. Very nice indeed. Never forget Henri Labrust. And never forget if you are to design a library to make it uh, uplifting, inspiring, imaginative, Beautiful, yes, beautiful, if this doesn't sound too old patient. And look here again at the structure. It's singing. It's singing because it doesn't reject beauty. Quite the opposite. It makes it possible. 
great work. And the books are happy on those shelves, I'm sure, although I didn't ask them and I didn't talk with them. And the people who study in our time, in the present, I think are happy too, because they are in a beautiful space, the space of learning. And statues, why not? And uh, screens with the modern technology, culture and technology, the present and the past together. It's a sophisticated library, inspiring. And the ceiling is the most inspiring. Uh, another work at, uh, in uh, Neuilly sur Seine, Hotel Touret, 1860. But after we saw those two libraries, uh, the other works are uh, a little bit, uh, you know, dark. And uh, although from the inside, uh, things are changed, as you can see. I mean, this is a beautiful room. And uh, I wish I wish I was in such a room myself right now, but I am not. Anyway, you know, the, the tall ceiling does matter. It does matter, but it's also true that if you have very tall ceilings, you can expect, uh, you know, increased uh, energy bills if you are to warm up or to cool off such a space. Hotel de Villegri, another building by Lavrust. I rush a little bit now because we are entering now in the second chapter of this presentation today, and that is with the very interesting Italian architect, Leonardo Savioli. Himself, uh, um, but you know what, I would prefer to have a discussion with you now a little bit before we, we, we begin to talk about, uh, about Savioli. Just a second, please. 